In the last module, we covered the beta-lactam antibiotic classes, also known as cell wall inhibitors. The next important category to cover are the cell synthesis inhibitors. They consist of fluoroquinolones, sulfonamides, the dihydrofolate reductase inhibitors, and nitroferritin. These classes act against enzymes and proteins responsible for cellular metabolism and reproduction. Like the penicillin classes, the fluoroquinolones have five different generations of drugs, each with slightly different microbes that they are aimed at. We won't cover those differences until a later module, but it's important to remember at this point that the phloxacin suffix distinguishes this drug class from others. Fluoroquinolones came to be in the 1960s and were greatly needed to fight the already developing penicillin-resistant strains of bacteria. It specifically targets a bacterial enzyme called topoisomerase, which is needed for the process of cell division. The earlier generations were great against topoisomerase 2, which was found in gram-negative bacteria. Later generations hindered topo 4, which is found in gram-positive bacteria. Despite the diversity, these two are now ineffective against many species of bacteria due to a shared gene mutation for an efflux pump within the bacteria. Sulfonamides inhibit the enzyme dihydropterate synthase by being analogs to PABA. By blocking this pathway, the folic acid synthesis within bacteria is hindered. Like humans, decreased folate can inhibit the ability to create more DNA, which is why this drug class is categorized as bacteriostatic as opposed to bacteriocidal. Resistance has grown as some bacteria have developed increased or alternative ways to produce PABA. Why do you think this antibiotic doesn't affect human cells? Similar to DHTS, dihydrofolate reductase also plays a part in the synthesis of folate. As the name states, it reduces folate. Trimethoprim and pyrimethamine are the two prescriptions of importance in this drug class. Methotrexate also falls into the category by mechanism of action, but it is also used in diseases of autoimmune disorders. These two drugs have a wide variety of uses, including antibacterial, antiprotozoal, and antifungal. As they are teratogenic and have other side effects as well, it may be important to monitor patients when on these drugs. Lastly for this section, nitroferritone is the outcast. It's a unique synthetic drug that doesn't really belong to any other class. It damages bacterial DNA as well as ribosomal proteins. Its only real indication at this moment is for UTIs in pregnant patients due to the first-line treatments, ciprofloxacin and TMP-SMX, being teratogens. Now, to treat Clostridium, we have to first consider that they are anaerobes and spore-forming bacterium. This makes them naturally difficult to kill. As you learned earlier in this module, even heat doesn't always eliminate them, especially when in spore form. For tetanus, the majority of individuals in the developed world are vaccinated. However, as the developed immunity can wane after many years, a booster is suggested every 10 years. If you did come across a patient that was not vaccinated, or it's been over 10 years since their last booster, the first thing to do is immediately give the antitoxin and debride the wound to prevent further toxin spread. Also, administering metro or penicillin to kill off any other offending microbes may be in order. Without treatment, up to 60% of adults and up to 90% of infants can die from tetanus. As botulism is generally ingested or injected, in the case of Botox, there is much less to do but take supportive means and deliver antitoxin. Intubation may be necessary to keep a paralyzed airway open, and penicillin or metro can be given to eradicate the bug. For C. perfringens, it is much less common than the other Clostridium species. Often it leads only to food poisoning, which is handled supportively. For myonecrosis, a combination of penicillin and clindamycin, or clinda and metro, may be used. C. diff is a tricky bug as it is often caused by antibiotic use. As such, using those antibiotics is obviously going to cause more harm than good. Strong antigram positive activity or anti-anaerobic activity may be used to combat this microbe. Fecal transplant is also becoming more frequently used as well to recolonize the intestines with healthy bacteria. For the curved rods, Listeria gets a good old penicillin. Luckily, it hasn't yet formed resistance that is commonly seen today. Diphtheria forms another one of our vaccine-preventable diseases. It, too, can have a waning immunity over time and should be given a booster shot every 10 years. If a child is not up to date with their immunizations, or if an individual is from another country, consider this pathogen. It is still a highly contagious disease that requires immediate treatment. Antitoxin is used here as well. These gram-positive rods sure do like their toxins. Diphtheria can also be treated with penicillin or erythromycin if there's an allergy to pens. Anthrax is another toxin-forming spore. There's a military vaccine for this one, but it's not available to the public. Besides the anthrax male scare a few years ago, this is a very uncommon disease to see. However, that raised awareness of the potential for this microbe to be used as a bioweapon. It is generally susceptible to Cipro and Doxy. The last two here I always mix up. 
Actinomyces is a bit of a confusing one to treat because it can depend on the severity. If there's only a mild infection, normally a penicillin will do the trick. However, if the disease is more severe or there's a fistula formed, surgical debridement is needed and sometimes it can be treated with TMP-SMX. Nocardia, on the other hand, is a tough bug from the get-go. To treat this, go straight to TMP-SMX. In fact, it often takes several months of treatment with this antibiotic to be effective. It is an intracellular organism which limits the effectiveness of many antibiotics. To sum up this tier, we have now covered the cell wall inhibitors and the cell synthesis inhibitors up to this point. They were some of the first and most widely used antibiotics. This also means that they are of particular concern for antibiotic resistance. In the treatment tier for the next module, we will look into the protein inhibitors. This module will cover the gram-positive rods, which includes the popular Clostridium family. It is important to remember that these fall under the ABC anaerobes, along with actinomyces, which is why you won't find them causing diseases in aerobic tissue, such as the lung. There are also several spore-forming species in this category, namely Clostridium and Bacillus species. Unlike actinomyces, the other branching rod does cause lung disease. Nocardia is also unique in being one of the few acid-fast bacteria, though only mildly. Within this module, the two most commonly associated with neonatal and pediatric illnesses would be listeria and diphtheria. Some sources link listeria to the torch grouping for congenital infections, while diphtheria and other vaccine-preventable diseases are making a comeback in recent years due to decreased vaccination rates. We've covered quite a bit of material in the short amount of time. Do make sure to follow along with our module assignments if taking this course online. They are designed to be entertaining and fully engage learners with the concepts in each module to promote better retention. Also, be sure to complete a review session of the material covered in this and the previous module. Take notes on difficult concepts and factors, and consider making flashcards or other memory devices for these. Visit the free MedEd blog for useful tips on creating medical mnemonics and accelerated learning strategies.